when it comes to plants that were being used for their psychoactive properties, we're going to see a big theme that we've seen consistent with many of the units and chapters that we've covered this semester. People found plants in their environment that they could use for their psychoactive properties. And similar to what we saw with the medicinal plants, there was generally just one person or a small group of people within the larger group that was charged or given permission or given the right or however you want to phrase it. Um, they were the ones who were able to use these plants for their psychoactive properties. So one of the things we see is, again, this kind of interweaving of plants being used for multiple purposes, because a lot of these plants on this list were often used for medicinal purposes, not just for their mind altering, um, mind altering purposes. Now, one thing that we do need to keep in mind when we're looking at these different plants um, and the compound that's being extracted, most of the time it's going to be an alkaloid, that kind of bitter tasting compound that's being extracted, and that compound is going to then affect our biochemistry, whether that's releasing dopamine or serotonin or oxytocin or getting the adrenal glands to release adrenaline, or maybe it's getting endorphins to start to pulse through the body. Whatever is happening, essentially what we are going to see is that altering of the biochemistry. Now, with modern knowledge and our technological abilities, we are finding that for some of these situations that the compound is actually altering gene expression. And this is what's so uh, devastatingly scary when we start to talk about the poppy plant and the opioids. Now, the opioids are extracted from the poppy fruit, cut into that capsule and get that, that latexy, disgusting looking goo. And in that goo, you're going to have the opioids. There are lots of different types of opioids. They're commonly prescribed under the names of codeine or Vicodin. When we go in for surgery or we break a bone, these are the most commonly prescribed uh, pain medication. One weird little side effect of the opioids that you need to be aware of is that they can cause constipation. We're going to need some pumpkin for that, apparently, or, or something else. But anyways, that's a whole other discussion. Let's focus on those opioids. We now know that those opioids can interact with two gene variants that are discussed in the lecture slides, and that once those gene variants have been activated, we can't turn that off. And why this becomes so problematic is if somebody goes in for a broken arm and gets prescribed something like Vicodin, they may have the gene variant that causes them to be more likely to get addicted. So what initially started out with the best of intentions, we want to help and alleviate your pain, leads to this really awful circumstance. And for people who have opioid addictions, it's something that never goes away. That is something that will always be with them. Now we do find with other addictions that it, the addiction is, to the substance maybe isn't as strong, there is a possibility that people can overcome it. But when it comes to the opioids, this is a very, very, very strong addiction. And most people don't find out that, that they could have ever become addicted to it until they are exposed to the substance. And that's the heartbreaking part of it. In um, some circles, we call that the one hit wonder. You get exposed to it once and for the rest of your life, you are now dependent on the substance. Now, for many of us, we think of caffeine. Caffeine is an addictive substance, but people can walk away from that, or some people don't even have any response at all. The people who can drink coffee and go to sleep, they are unusual to those of us who drink a pot of coffee and are bouncing off the walls for the next 12 to 24 hours. So keep this in mind when you're looking at these different uh, plant compounds. Sometimes we have a clear genetic connection, like with poppy and op opioids, and with others, we don't. Now, when we look at opioids, they weren't just used for uh, pain. They have also been used as cough drops in the past, and they've been used for a lot of, of different, to treat a lot of different illnesses and ailments. Our relationship with the poppy plant and the opioids is changing today. Make note in the lecture slides that there have been uh, large conflicts over the resource of poppy plants and the distribution of that resource throughout the planet. And keep in mind that most of our poppies being grown for opioids 
come from Afghanistan, and that the pockets where we see the highest amounts of conflict is where this resource is being grown or where the resource is being distributed to. So this is definitely one of those situations where we've, we've got a beautiful plant. The poppy is gorgeous. We've got a compound that can be extracted from it that can do help, but we also know can do some harm. And then it ripples out and affects so many other systems. Marijuana, on the other hand, <laughs> has a very different relationship. Now, marijuana has been used for a long period of time for its medicinal purposes, and the values surrounding marijuana had changed, and so it got classified as a plant being used only for its psychoactive properties. Because of that classification, it held the scientific community back. They weren't able to extract compounds. They weren't able to do research on this plant to see if the correlations that previous um, generations and previous people had seen really um, were strong correlations. Maybe we even had causation. Maybe this is a plant that could be used for its medicinal purposes as well. So recently, the changes in social values and thus the legal system um, has allowed researchers to start to go in and investigate uh, marijuana, specifically the CBD, the, at least 113 different CBD uh, molecules and the things that they could potentially treat. And then we're also getting research now into the THC molecule, which previously has had the perspective that it's only for uh, use for, for psychoactive properties and how it can alter people's brain chemistry. But our perspective on that is starting to change. I mean, if we take antidepressants to alter our brain chemistry, then maybe THC could help in that field as well. Maybe we've been overlooking this because of our values and we haven't seen the medicinal properties of that compound in helping to reset some of the the brain biochemistry that might be out of balance or not working as well as, as we would like it to work. And this brings us back to that initial article at the beginning of the semester about LSD, looking at how LSD can alter neuronal connections. So those people who have PTSD and, and have the neurons have developed connections that are very problematic, um, we can go in and maybe prune those rewrite or edit the way how the brain works, that can be hugely beneficial for people who are struggling and have tried a lot of other things that aren't working. So sometimes our values get in the way of seeing what the plant world um, can, or even the synthetic world can offer to us. So another plant that has been used for both medicinal properties, but is now strongly uh, categorized as a, psycho a plant being used for psychoactive properties is coca. The compound being extracted is cocaine. Cocaine, of course, has a numbing quality. And so in the field of dentistry, it was used commonly to numb the jaw before you had to do something like a tooth extraction. And then once you yank that tooth out, you put a lot of cocaine in there to help keep that jaw numb while it hurts so desperately bad. So again, another plant that spans both the medicinal and psychoactive chapters. Tobacco has uh, a bit of a mixed history as well. Of course, tobacco products have primarily been smoked, and nicotine is the compound that's being extracted from those or what we're seeking. Unfortunately, in the processing of tobacco into products like cigars and cigarettes, there were a lot of additional compounds added, um, specifically arsenic and the benzene groups and things that we knew were carcinogenic. And so tobacco, smoking tobacco became strongly associated with developing lung cancer. Now, what's been interesting is seeing the recent research into vaping and just straight nicotine vaping without all of the extra flavor additives. Now, remember back when we talked about herbs and spices and we talked about the idea that imitation vanilla is made from crude oil, benzene groups, carcinogenic. So if we remove all of those kinds of flavorings that often come from byproducts of the crude oil, um, crude oil refining process have a lot of benzene groups. If we remove all of those and all we have is just the nicotine and some water and maybe a, a safe um, biological oil, it looks like we might have a safe delivery system for nicotine. So looking for some long-term research, some long-term 
uh, longitudinal longitudinal studies to show us concisely concisely whether or not this is a safer way to deliver nicotine. Um, so that's still an unanswered question at this time, but we know that nicotine in and of itself may not necessarily have as many detrimental problems as it, we once thought it did in, um, in tobacco products. Uh, tobacco too was once used for children <laughs> as, as a little treat, um, but more recently is now just an adult product. Peyote is a little bit less widely known and less widely used, and that's because it comes from the fruit of a cactus down through Central America. Fortunately, there aren't a lot of cacti, and the cacti grow very slowly, not a lot of rain, and the soils are really poor in nutrients, so those cacti are never going to get very big or grow very fast. And one of the things that we're struggling with is that people have been poaching those plants for the peyote, for those hallucinogenic properties that the fruit can give them. Another plant from Central America that's a little less known is Datura, also known as Jimson weed. Now you can take those seeds, and those seeds do have um, some effects on people, but definitely not as dramatic as, say, the poppy, cocaine, tobacco, and even peyote. When we start to look around the world, we see that other cultures have found plants like kava, take the roots, um, and that can work as an antidepressant. Again, altering that biochemistry to shift um, towards more of the happy, happy, joy, joy chemicals. We have something called cat. Now, chewing cat, uh, you chew the leaves of the shrub. Um, we can extract the compound cathinone. Again, playing around with the biochemistry so that people can feel euphoria, feel happier, feel less depressed. Cat and cathinone extracted from it have those effects. And another plant from South America is ayahuasca. Maybe you've heard about this in the ceremonies associated with this, where people are, again, altering their mood, altering how their brain functions in order to maybe change their thinking patterns, maybe get some insight into problems that they have or, or insight into life that they didn't have otherwise. So consistently across groups of people, we see that humans have always sought out different plant products different compounds that are going to alter our brain biochemistry, alter our perspective, alter how we see things. A big unanswered question out there, it's hard to get a lot of funding for, is whether or not other animals have the same response. Are other animals seeking out these kinds of compounds? When robins and other birds are migrating through and the fruit has become fermented, are they seeking that out? Are they like, are they hanging out before their migration going, hey man, I know this great place. We hit up these trees. If we get there at just the right time, we are going to get some great berries. It's going to be great. Like, we don't know. We don't speak Robin. We don't know what the birds are talking about. But we have observed these results. We have observed that animals will go and chew on things. They'll go and eat things. And we got to ask that question. They know something we don't know. Are they trying to alter their biochemistry the same way that we do? Because if all humans have discovered this and want to do this to one level or another, then it begs the question that there's got to be other animals out there as well. Now, I have to go and look into this. Apparently somebody gave some octopus, uh, octopi ecstasy. And there's some interesting results that the octopi act very similar to humans. So I'm going to go look into that and see where some of this fringe research is at and what other uh, substances we've been giving to other animals and if anybody else has discovered are we really the only ones who do this or are there other organisms out there doing this as well and the one thing that i will say is that i'm glad to see our cultural values start to shift from a scientific point of view i think it's important that we have causation that we know what the compounds are what they cause in the organisms. At the minimum, we need to know strong correlation. We have to have better understanding of the genetic connection. Are we messing around with the genes? Are we messing around in such a way that's irreversible? The more knowledge we have, the better we'll be at using these products, at using the world and the plant around us, and the better we'll be at interacting with one another. So if you have any questions, 
if you want to talk to me about any of this, please, please, please send me an email.